Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is What is your treasure? And it is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Mergen, Queensland, Australia on the 16th of December 2012. This is part one. The subject that I wanted to talk with you about this morning, it's part of the Human Soul series of talks that we've given, of which there are now about 70 or 80. <laughs> and this one is, what is your treasure? Now, many of you don't know too much about the Bible. Some of you do, I know, but no, many of you don't. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background in that there are four accounts in the Bible, four, or four what are called books in the Bible, that refer to details about my life, and they mention Mary very briefly. Um, they only mention Mary uh, specifically on three occasions, I think. Um, they, those four accounts are, are called the gospel accounts. You might have heard of that term. And the reason why they're called the gospel is the gospel of the good news of peace is what, is what it's referring to, a term that I sometimes used in the first century. Those four accounts were Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And Matthew, Mark were both... Uh, people who lived after I passed from the earth. Matthew was a person who I had contact with in the first century before I died. Um, and so he had some first-hand or first-hand experience of myself. Mark is a, uh, was a young man when I died. He was 16 or 17, 17 years of age, I think, from memory, when I passed. His name was John Mark or Mark. And... Um, uh, I knew him, obviously, as well, so that was a first-hand account. And then there was the account of Luke. And Luke's account, Luke was, is my son-in-law, uh, basically. He married my daughter, Sarah, in the first century. And him and Sarah, he and Sarah, and Mary lived in France for a period of time. Um, and this enabled Luke to ask Mary many things about our life that we had in the three and a half years that I presented my ministry. And for Mary, she was with me for about 18 months of that. And so he, he could ask her many questions about our life together and what I actually did say and so forth. And for that reason, the account of Luke in the Bible contains many things that are not contained in the other books. The accounts of Matthew and Mark contain very many similar things. And the accounts of Luke and John, and I know the Bible book of John is claimed to be written by John, but the reality is also there that uh, there was a mixture of things occurring where a lot of the material actually came from Mary as well through her, her channeling and also through her memories. Uh, and they were relayed to both Luke and John. And, uh, and it was a collaborative effort of the book of John. But why I bring all this up is because the book of Luke contains many interesting things about this issue of what is your treasure. And I'd like to quote some of them to you through the process of delivering this uh, event to you this morning. Before I do, though, I would like to ask you or recommend to you that you ask yourself three things. And it perhaps is worth writing some of these things down um, because this will form the basis of your attempt to know what your treasures are. It's only when you know what your treasures are and know how to determine what you treasure that you can start working on the secondary issue which I want to raise today, which is the issue of desire, how to grow desire. So what I'd like to do is ask you a few questions. Firstly, the first question is a very important question, and that is, what do 
you think you treasure. Now, if, let's uh, treasure, uh, jumping ahead of myself there a bit. My suggestion is that you let yourself just free think about that question without any judgment. In other words, you sit down, take a bit of time and go, what are the things that I think that I think are important? You know, the things that I believe I think are important. The things that I f feel I treat as important. What are those things? Do any of you want to list some of them? You want to start? Uh, you guys down the front there, Yvonne and Barb. So. Um, the first thing that came to mind was learning and growing. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing was learning yeah. for you, learning and growing, yeah. And the second thing was um, making a difference for humanity. Sorry, making, making a difference in the world, making, making a difference for in the world, yeah, making mm -hmm. a difference in the world. And, and I'm sh assuming that you want it to be a positive difference. Oh yes, please. Okay, <laughs> I've had enough negative influence. <laughs> uh, so let's make it a positive, yeah. you know, difference in the world, yeah. yeah. Okay. The first thing that came to my mind was um, my freedom. So you, in I what treasure, way? you treasure, treasure your my freedom? freedom. Okay, mm. freedom. So that would include, would it not, your freedom to make a choice? Oh, all freedoms, yes. To, to yes. choose, to, to live. Because as a child, most of us didn't have any freedom. Yeah, I agree. And I've now realised that I've rebelled against that all of my life since And a lot then. of us are still in rebellion about the fact <laughs> we never got any. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, good. Anything else came to your mind instantly as soon as you thought of that question? What are the things you treasure? If we come down the front here and then up the back, right up the back. Um, if you, yep. So let's start at the back, actually. Yeah. Um, mine was a bit of a shock to me, more of an addiction. I, um, I like to make people happy around me. Right, so, yep, like to make people happy. Making people happy, we should got. There's no harm in making people happy as long as it's not an addiction, is there? It's like a nice thing to treasure. Yep. That's to me, it's very important to live in my desires. To, to live. find, like, real my my desires that I, I need to spend like most of my time in, you know. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's just that makes me happy. That's what makes you happy. So, so could you say? Um, being happy is also something that you being treasure? happy, like creating what I like. Yep. Good night. Um, let's go to Monique there, is that? And if we come across Tara, let's go to Tara first. Uh, she's faster. Yeah. Um, spending time with my children. Okay. So, so I realise that that's only when they're being peaceful and harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> spending time with children, yeah. So can we say spending time with family? Yeah, shall family. We, that shall we call that? Liam, he's not my child. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Good, so you treasure that, yeah. And money, if we... And then we go backwards. I spent a lot of time um, creating security and avoiding my fear. Right, so you would like your treasure security. And it's understandable that a person would treasure security, isn't it? Like, it's always great to be safe, isn't it, and secure. It's far better to be safe and secure than unsafe and insecure. <laughs> Don't you feel? Yeah, and also um, spending as much time with God as I can. Right, so, so relationship with God, shall we say that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if we go, yep, to uh, Zinka, Janine. Zinka and Janine. Uh, feeling healthy and well. So, yeah, wanting some sense of uh, physical well-being. Should we call it physical and emotional well-being? Yep, so... Okay, so... And these are all pretty reasonable things to treasure, aren't they? If we go further behind and then come forward. 
living a more fulfilled life. So what, what, how would you define that though? Let's, let's define that. More loving. So you want to develop in, in love? love? Yeah. yeah? Mm. More harmonious. And harmony? Yeah, more giving. Okay. If we come down to Deb, uh, and then we just work our way down actually on that side, and if we go up to the back on this side and work our way down there as well. So if we have the mic at the back on that side. So if you can handle this side, and Monica can handle that side. Uh, who's got the mics? You have the mic, Lily. Go up the back, please, <laughs> and just start right at the back, and I'll work my way forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whoever's got their hand up, give it, give it to them at the back. <laughs> and the same on this side. Who's next? Deb. Um, well, I'm sure you're going to have something <laughs> to say about this, but I would say my soulmate. So my soulmate. Okay. Yeah. So, in other words, uh, relationship with partner, shall we call it? Yeah. Yep. And why would I have something negative to say about that? <laughs> I'm totally passionate about my relationship with my partner. <laughs> so used to being afraid, aren't you? If we can't, so who is next? Who is, I'm not choosing, you're choosing now. And we're starting, you're starting at the front, so let's start at the front, okay. Uh, integrity and honesty. Sorry, integrity. Integrity and honesty. So could we call that developing your character? Okay. So developing my own character, should we call that, where you have qualities such as integrity, honesty, truthfulness, openness, all those kind of things. Who was on this side first? Far away. Oh, uh, since living in the country, I've really realised how much I treasure nature. Okay, so uh, should we call it uh, assisting the environment, shall we? Okay, yep, and on this side? I think I treasure the teachings of divine truth. Okay, so the teachings of basically how to have a relationship with God, isn't it? Okay, and on this side, who's next? Um, I think I treasure my home and the life that I've created for myself now when I look back on... Um, how I've lived my life in the past to what it is today. So should we call that your personal environment? Yep. Yeah. And also um, the gifts that I receive from God. Like I. Okay, I, gifts that you receive. Yeah. yeah. Like for me, it's mediumship. Yeah. Among other things, but. Good. Prominently that. Yeah, that's good. That. Who's next? So. Yep. Um, assisting others. So, uh, if let's be more specific, uh, how would you assist others? Like. Um, as being an example. So sort of. you're saying that you would, one of the things you treasure is help, being able to help others yep. to do what? To murder other people? Oh, no, to, to grow. <laughs> to grow. <laughs> I hope I don't. Well, there's people that do that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's plenty of people who, who in their arms manufacturing business that are just there to help a country destroy another. So um, I guess to assist others to develop more, be more in love and truth. Okay, so you're talking about helping others um, get closer to love, really. Yep. Is that? Yes. That, yep. To love, yeah. And also to have fun. To have fun, yeah, yep. very good. Have fun. Well, I think we've, uh, I've exhausted my board now, so we can't, there's obviously a lot of things that, that we think we treasure, right? Okay. Now, one of the interesting things to do next, and this is what I'd write down as part of the exercise for you next, is to ask yourself, what are your highest priorities of the things you treasure? Does that make sense? So in other words, we've written down all the things we treasure, and then what we do is we sort of put it into some kind of prioritised thing as to what's the most important thing to me. And then what's the next important thing to me? And what's the next important thing to me? And so forth. And this still is what I think is the next most important thing. Right? So, so 
who would put relationship with partner right up there with, uh, as mo one of the most important things that you'd want to develop? Yeah, quite a few. Not everyone, interestingly. Um, developing your own character, who would put that up pretty high? So the majority, yeah, very good. Who would put relationship with God up there pretty high? Now, is that higher than developing your own character? For how, how many of you feel that's higher than developing your own character? About half, should we say? Okay, and the other half feel that developing your own character is more important than relationship with God, perhaps? Yeah. See, this is where you have to think about what is more important to me when you do this. You, you get that? That's the whole point of doing this exercise. So, the second part of the exercise, and I'd really like to leave them there. And so you're right with that? I'm going to leave some of them there because we want to refer to some of them. So I'm going to just turn around the board and say the next part of this, the uh, step. So part number two was to prioritise the list of treasures. So that's, that's number two. And you get the idea of that. You're basically what you're doing there is you're making a list and then what you're doing is sorting out what's more important to you, this thing or that thing, this thing or that thing, basically. And you get, you'll get some things that you feel are sort of of equal importance. If that's the case, write them next to each other and they are of equal importance. But you'll get a sort of priority list of what you believe are the most important things that are a part of your life. Now, the third thing you do is write down what you spend most of your time doing. Okay? So of the previous list that we had, um, I can actually flip that over, not so easy, so it's going to go around. Of the previous list we had as an example, you would go, okay, that's my list of what I treasure. What do I actually spend most of my time doing on that list? And you write that down as the priority list. So in other words, if you spend 40 hours a week um, in your, on your personal environment, then put 40 hours next to that. You follow me? If you spend one hour a day on your relationship with God, you write down seven hours for the week on that. If you spend, you know, two hours a day with your partner generally, then you'd write down 14 hours a week for that. You follow me? If you spend, you know, like learn, learning, and if you think about it, you go, yeah, probably new things maybe one or two hours a week I spent actually doing that. So you write that down. So what you'll get is a picture of the things you spend the most time doing once you, once you get that list. And you'll be able to, if you do it with separate pieces of paper or separate books even, so that you can look at them both side by side, what you'll get is a picture of what you believed were your priorities in your life, and a picture of what actually are your priorities in your life. Do you understand? You will have two lists. The first list is what you believed was important to you. And the second list is what you spend the most time doing, which is the things that are actually the most important to you. So, if we go back to the questions... The fourth step in this process is honestly examine the comparison of the two lists.
Now, by the way, you may find in this one what, what, down, what you spend the most time doing. You may have to actually add to the list that, things that weren't on your first list. So for many of us, I, we didn't see on our first list work. wasn't there, right? <laughs> Um, of course, some of it might involve work, but that really wasn't there for 40 hours a week. But on this list, it would definitely have to be there for most of us, right? And unless we're working in our passion, it, it'll be something that's not on the previous list. So you can see that this list may end up being quite different to your first list. Right? And the key is to be just really honest with yourself about this, to have an honest self-reflection about what's really going on. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you today is that the reality is that everything you believe is important to you is actually not important to you. The reality is that it's everything that you spend the most time on that is the most important thing to you, for whatever reason. Now, People go, but I don't like work. And I say, well, why are you doing it for 40 hours a week then? Why don't you find a job you love and do that for 40 hours a week? That would make more sense, right? Why don't we do that? Because we have a fear associated with doing that. We don't, or we have a belief that we're not worthy of that or that we'll never be able to attain that. That's why we do it. That's why we finish up choosing to spend time on things that don't matter in comparison to the things that do. And when I say don't matter, we must believe they do matter. And we have an emotional reason, usually it's an addiction, an emotional reason why we believe it matters. So for example, if we're spending time, if we go back to this first list, if we're spending time, right, on, we say to ourselves, most important thing to me is my relationship with God, but but the reality is that I'm spending seven hours a week on that, right? And I'm spending 14 hours a week on that, my relationship with my partner, then the most important thing to you isn't your relationship with God. The reality is the most important thing to you is your relationship with your partner. Because that's the thing you're spending more time on. Does everyone get that? Okay. Thanks. If we go right at the back. Hi, AJ. Um, there's something that I feel I struggle with, and that's like I set this intention, yep, today I'm going to, going to connect with God, that's going to be a priority, and then I get into my garden and do my stuff, and then I get to the end of the day and, like, where's God been, you know? And exactly. So, so is it really your priority? No, and I understand that, so... So it's not what you treasure? No. You treasure spending time in your garden more than you spent time with God, so therefore your garden was more important than God. Exactly. Yep. But where I still struggle is... You I still don't... have the feeling of the intention, don't you? Yes, yeah. yes. But where I struggle is I don't feel that connecting to God means sitting down and going, oh, I'm going to spend seven hours connecting to God. So... I agree totally. Yep. So yep. how do, or what are ways that you've discovered, say, that where you can do your garden and connect to God in that process? Well, one thing I must state in this little exercise is that the human soul is capable of multitasking. So in other words, you don't have a finite amount of time available to you every week of, what is it, 172, what is it, 24 by 168 hours. You don't have that. You actually have more time available because some of the time you can do two things at the same time. Now, with some of those things, my suggestion is that it's very, very difficult to do two things at the same time. Like, it's very difficult to have sex with your partner while at the same time you're cooking. <laughs> you, might, you might try that, maybe, but you know, you've got all sorts of danger involved and everything that could go on there, you know, like, and I won't mention all those things. You, you try it and see. Okay. So, so there are some things that you'll find difficult. There are some things that you'll want to be totally committed to. And there's other things that don't matter quite so much. For example, caring for your personal environment, you do want to be committed to it. But, but you can obviously care for your physical environment while you're praying, for example. 
So you can do the two things at the same time. So we can multitask these different things. However, how you spend your time is a very good reflection of what is really the most important thing to you. That's the reality. The reality is how you spend your time. And if you add into this the equation of your resources, where you spend your money is also a very good indication of what is important to you. Huh? So, so if somebody said, oh, um, for some of you, you hardly spend any money on clothes, you just like the bare essentials. And that's maybe because you don't have a, very, a, self, a consciousness about your own appearance or your, a feeling about your own appearance. You don't, you've been taught from a young age that if you care about what you wear, then you know, you're self-absorbed and other things. So there's all emotional impacts on every one of these things that happen. So what I'm illustrating to you is that these lists expose two things. They expose, firstly, the things you treasure... And they also expose the things you think you treasure, but you don't actually treasure. Yeah. And this is very positive. It's very positive that we do this. The reason why it's very positive is because without this knowledge, we will not know what addictions we have. We will not know the different things that are going on in our lives that cause us to focus all of our resources and time and effort and other things onto certain things that are really time wasters, or that don't benefit our life in any positive direction, or that don't benefit our happiness, while at the same time avoiding a whole heap of things that could help our life positively and give us much joy and happiness. But to, to do it, we have to be honest with ourselves. It, it, you, don't, you don't need anybody else to tell you what you value. You, if you are honest with yourself, will know exactly what you value by seeing how much time you spend on specific things. So if you find you spend a lot of time on making people happy to the, to the extent that that is like you know, 20 hours a week and spending time with God is like 2 hours a week and spending time with your partner is 14 hours a week, what does that tell you? That tells you that making people happy, sorry, I've written that on the, on the wrong line, making people happy is actually more important to you emotionally than a relationship with God or a relationship with your partner. There's something that you get from making people happy that, that you can't get from God at this point and that you can't get from your partner which tells me that it must be an addiction, right? But there's something going on, if that's the case. This is the great thing about this self-analysis. Now, what does that have to do with what I mentioned the book of Luke says? Well, let me read you a few quotes from the book of Luke. Here's one. And he told them this parable. The ground... Of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for you for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. Now, this is why many of you go for the lottery every week. That's exactly what you're looking for. Do, do you understand? You're looking for, for many of you, you're looking for the ability to have all this money available so therefore you, don't, you feel you don't have to worry anymore. You have everything that you need, everything that you could want. Don't have to work so hard anymore. But God said to him... You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. You see, many, much of our life we spend treasuring the things that disappear. Have you noticed that? Character can't disappear. 
if you develop your relationship, that can never disappear for the rest of your existence. If you develop your relationship with God, that will never disappear for the rest of your existence. If you develop many of these other things, like, you know, relationships with people and so forth, none of those things will disappear. But what do you spend the most time developing? Usually we spend the most time developing things that disappear. Why would we do that? It's because we don't have a concept of us being an eternal being. So many of you think you have a concept that you're an eternal being, but your day-to-day actions demonstrate you don't. (laughs) This is where it requires being honest with oneself. Here's another one from the book of Luke. By the way, the first scripture I read, if you want to write it down, is Luke 12, 16 to 21. The second one is Luke 12, 31 to 34. It says, Nevertheless, seek continually his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. The actual statement I made was, Seek continually God's love, and everything else will be added to you. Have no fear, little flock, because your Father has approved you of giving you the kingdom. Now, at this stage, none of you really understand what that means, because none of you have lived in the celestial kingdom in the heavens. Right? So you don't understand what it means that God wants to give you the kingdom of the heavens. You don't understand what that would actually create inside of you if you could actually vision that place. And in fact, many of you don't understand that you're actually creating locations to get, get you there, to that place right now in the spirit world. Right? But let's continue. Sell, sorry, uh, yep, sell the things belonging to you and give gifts of mercy. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. A never failing treasure in the heavens where a thief does not get near or moth consume. For where your treasure is, there your hearts will be also. And that's the basis, that's the scripture that I'm using as the basis of this talk today. Where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. And where you spend your time is a reflection of where your heart is. So if we put that together, where you spend your time is where your treasure is. Now, what we need to do if we want to grow and we really want to have a truly everlasting existence that's happy, whether we're on the earth or in the spirit world, doesn't really matter. What we need to do is change what we treasure. In other words, we need to put our time into the things that are going to bring us the largest long-term benefit for the rest of our existence. And we need to start being very frugal with our time with the things that are unnecessary for our existence, but are things that feed our addictions. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And this allows you, this little exercise allows you to go through this process of that reflection. It allows you to see what's really going on. Not what you believe is going on. Not what you think is going on. But rather what is actually happening. How you spend your time tells you what is actually happening. Not what you imagine is happening, but what is real. Here's another verse. Oh, by the way, the previous one, if you didn't write it down, was Luke 12, 31 to 34, which is our theme verse, if you like. Luke 14, 16 to 24 is the next one I'd like to read to you. It says, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited. You see, there was no email or phone. So you had to to get somebody to go out and tell everybody, look, I'm ready, let's go. Come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, how many of you people buy a field without seeing it first? No one, right? Now, I suggest to you, this man had already seen the field probably 50 times before he bought it. And now 
He's invited to a banquet and he, and he doesn't want to go and he uses the field as an excuse. Right? Is he very sincere about his excuse? No, he can't even be honest about it. Right? Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Now, again, I don't know about you, but if you went and bought some cattle, wouldn't you first have checked them out to see whether they were any good for your purpose? So why does he need to go? And it's only one night. It's not like it's for the rest of his days or existence that he has to go. So again, an excuse. The third one said, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would have allowed him to bring his wife. But, but anyway, uh, that aside... Back then when we got married, we usually spent 30 days first with our partner and then there was a marriage ceremony. That's how you got married. The 30 days that you spent together was an indication of marriage, but you weren't married yet, but you spent 30 days, you were basically, basically betrothed, if you like, to each other. And then you got married, you had a ceremony. So this man had already spent his 30 days enjoying the company of his woman without any interruption. And he's already got married to her, and yet he still can't go to one night banquet. Did he want to go? Definitely not. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, I gave that illustration for one primary purpose. And that was to illustrate to every person who was listening that we were being offered something from God and that we did not appreciate it. And in fact, our day-to-day -day life, in our day-to-day -day life, we demonstrate the lack of appreciation we have for the gift of God's love that God began to offer in, in the first century through my coming and still has been offering for 2,000 years. And we, did not, we do not appreciate it. We, we do not even understand it to appreciate it. And yet there will be people, some people who, who, who come along afterwards who do appreciate it. And often it's the type people who are downtrodden, poor, hungry, emotionally disturbed, and other people like that who really start to appreciate what God is offering them before the people who have something. That's often the case. And in fact, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that God chose the ignoble things of the world to put the wise men to shame. There are many wise men over the last 2,000 years who have been offered the truth and offered love from God and have rejected it because they believe themselves to be so wise that they don't need it. There are many people who are just the average down-to-earth people, what many of us would refer to as the salt of the earth, who have received it and have, who have far exceeded the intellectual and physical capacities that are available to those so-called intelligent people. Because they realise one thing, and that is what God is offering you is better than anything else you could ever have. And that's something that the majority of us still do not appreciate. And our daily life demonstrates we don't appreciate it. Our daily life, because of how we use our time, demonstrates we don't appreciate it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So what we need to do then is ask ourselves some basic things. If we can list our treasures, we obviously know what they are. If we can list our time and how we spend our time, we can obviously see what is the thing that is the most important to us in terms of the use of our time. The main problem that we obviously then have is a lack of self-examination. 
a lack of an ability to see ourselves as we truthfully are. That's our problem. And that's the, what I would call denial. That's like the top layer of most of our existence. We deny what is true to ourselves. Now, honestly, if you deny what is true to yourself, you have no hope of ever discovering truth while that condition remains. The only time that you're going to discover more truth is if you no longer deny the truth to yourself. It doesn't really matter what anybody else says to you about truth. If you deny it to yourself, it is impossible for change to occur. Impossible. It doesn't matter whether Jesus tells you the truth, Mary tells you the truth, other people tell you the truth. It doesn't matter if any angel comes to you and tells the truth. It doesn't matter if any celestial spirit comes and tells you the truth. It doesn't even matter if your child tells you the truth or a wicked spirit tells you the truth or some kind of malevolent person tells you the truth or some angry person tells you the truth. It doesn't really matter where you get it from. If you are in denial of the truth yourself, you will never receive it from any of those locations. It doesn't matter how good they are, in terms of people or beings, or bad they are in terms of people or beings, you are still not going to receive the truth. The only way we're going to receive the truth is that if we treasure it. And what I'm suggesting to you, that requires self-examination. So the real question then becomes, and it's something I'd like to raise with you, the real question again becomes, now... How do you know what is important to you? How do you know what is important in your heart? Will you know by the time you spend on it? That's how you know. The time you spend on it. Now, if that's the way we know, then what do we finish up doing most of the time? Well, we finish up doing a lot of different things and looking at the time we spend on it. How do you allocate your energy, money, and time. How do you allocate it? Well, you allocate it currently on the things that are the most important to you. That's how you allocate it. And I'm suggesting that it's great because it tells you exactly where you are in your own development and in your own relationship with God. And even it tells you exactly where you are in your relationship with your partner, your relationship with your family. It tells you exactly where you are in developing personally with love, teaching truth, gifts that you receive. It tells you everything just by knowing how much time you spend on everything. It tells you everything. You have the ability to be completely self-aware just through one exercise. How many of you have ever done that exercise? Just a couple. Yeah. And many of you still not being honest with it. Right? Because we can often do the exercise and then completely ignore the results as well. Right? To actually truthfully do it, we're going to not ignore the results, results of the exercise. We'll actually take steps to actually correct what is the seeming imbalance between one thing and the other. So when we did this first list, we, we can say, yes, these are all very, very good things to treasure. When we did the time list, now we can see the difference between what we treasure and what we actually do. Now we can be honest with ourselves and say, okay, this is telling me what I actually treasure, which is not this list. This list, this list is not what I actually treasure. Once I start writing the times next to everything, I really start seeing what I treasure. Right? And many times we are ignoring things that we think we treasure because we feel it's too hard to ever get them. Is that not true? So, so how many of you are in a, not in a relationship at the moment? Leave your hand up if you treasure the thought of a relationship. Okay, so most of the people still have their hand up. And I'm saying, you don't treasure the thought of a relationship. <laughs> There's something blocking you from treasuring the thought of a relationship. Otherwise, you'd probably be in one. That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Yep. If you go right up the back. <coughs> oh, Graham first, sorry. Sorry. Yep. 
Um, how do we allow for our own self-deception? Like we might say, oh, I spend four hours a day praying, but, you know, if we're praying for a Mercedes and, and you know, <laughs> a good job and that yeah. sort of stuff, you know, um, how do we allow for our self-deception where we think we're doing something but we're not? Well, this is the problem with the lack of self-analysis that's honest, is that you can deceive yourself for, a, for the rest of your existence. And there's nothing you can do about it unless you're willing to see things more honestly. Most people are totally unwilling to see themselves honestly. And what I've been trying to help you do through these discussions about love, lessons in love, ethics, morality, and all these other discussions, is to expose a lack of self-honesty. Does that make sense? Because it, it's only by being completely self-aware and honest that you will actually have any idea of what's really going on. The other thing that needs to be considered is that God's relationship with you never lies to you. So, so if you are not receiving from God specific things you're asking for, God's not lying to you. God's not withholding them. God's telling you there's something wrong. So a relationship with God can greatly expose your lack of personal awareness. But to be honest, if you desire to remain completely closed to the, to the concept of truth, you will remain completely closed to the concept of truth for as long as it takes you to stay in that condition until you tire of that condition. That's how God created you with free will. You are allowed to make the choice to lie to yourself. You're allowed to do that. Most of us do that regularly. Most of us do that out of preference. Right? Many of you, when you come to me and ask me a question, I give you an answer, and you lie to me almost instantly. And you say, oh, no, I don't feel I have that problem, or no, I can't agree with that, or whatever. And that's fine. It's no skin off my nose if you choose to continue to believe what you currently believe. None whatsoever. It doesn't affect me at all. But it does affect you. It affects the rest of your existence. It affects how rapidly you are going to develop in your relationship with God. So at some point, a person has to go through this place of stopping self-deception and getting into a place where they actually want to know the truth about themselves. Now, you remember right at the beginning when you heard the divine truth? Right at the beginning, when you heard the divine truth, it was a lot of external truth. And you really loved hearing it. It resonated with your soul. You could feel a lot of things in that, right? And you really loved hearing it. It's when you had the, when you had the most trouble was when you began to have to self-reflect about what's personally going on. That's when you have the most trouble. That's where the self-deception begins. I speak on a daily basis to many people who are totally unaware of their own condition because they want to be. Many of you fall into that category, that you want to be completely unaware of your own condition. You want to be. People give you opportunities every day when they tell you the truth to expose your own condition and you deny it completely because you want to. That is a lack of self-examination. To truly, to, to benefit from this exercise, you need to be able to truly examine yourself the way God sees you. And that is certainly not the way you see you, because if it was, you'd already be at one with God. See, when you see yourself exactly the way God sees you, and you're working through the issues with God, you'll eventually become at one with God. But if you do not see yourself the way God sees you, you can never become at one with God. And in fact, when you become at one with God, you'll see yourself exactly the way God sees you. Exactly. That would be the first time in your existence that you've ever seen yourself truthfully. Uh, and we need to be conscious of that. All right. So, what are the things that you actually value? Many times, we think we value words, but words are not valuable. 
And I've, I've got some quotes here that I, I wanted to read through. Words are often empty, hollow, just said to prevent the truth from being known. Isn't that the fact? What about fanfare or show? Many of you are addicted to that. Show is about creating impression, an inaccurate impression of your soul. You're trying to have other people not see you when you do things for show. What about facade or image? Facade is a costume for the undeveloped soul. Facade is a costume for the undeveloped soul. What about fake feelings? Well, these may fool others, but do you think they fool God? Of course not. There's a great verse that I'd like to read to you. It says, this is from Isaiah, by the way, in the Bible, 15, 29, 15 and 16. It says, Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the potter pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Many of you feel that way with God. You sort of feel like God knows nothing about you and that you can carry on a facade. You can't. Give it up. Like, what's the point of having it if, if with God, the primary relationship that you have that will benefit you for the rest of the life, facade does not work, when are you going to give it up? When are you going to give up the facade that you're wanting to maintain? When are you even going to give up the reasons why you want to maintain it? I've also made some others that, what about not fake holiness? You know what fake holiness is? Is being good without having any goodness inside. Right? Now, how many people are like that? You meet a lot of people even day-to-day -day life like that, right? Who outwardly have the showy appearance of being good, but there's no goodness inside. That's why I said to the Pharisees, you are like white washed graves. Inside, you are full of dead men's bones. And what I meant by that was not only were they personally tainted by the rotting flesh of their own soul, if you like, but also they had caused many deaths of other people and those penalties of those deaths were inside of their soul as well. Right? That's what we do when we have a fake holiness. The most dangerous people on earth are the people who think they are right and are willing to be violent to prove it. You think about it. The most dangerous people are the people who are willing to be violent just to prove they are right. They'll do almost anything. They'll murder, rape, pillage. Why do you think all the holy wars happened all through the dark ages? Because of people like that. Why do you think the Spanish Inquisition happened? Because of people like that. Not self-righteousness. Feeling better than others just demonstrates arrogance, not love. Right. So if we truly, truly want to see ourselves accurately, it is going to require of us a much deeper sense of self-reflection than what many of us have been engaging up to this point. So what can we do about that? That's the question. Well, what I'm suggesting is that you can grow your treasure in different areas than it currently appears. But to do that will require actionable change on your behalf. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that let's say you do this list and you find that, yep, being, um, spending time, um, where is it? Making people happy. I even put it on the wrong one then. Making people happy. Obviously, I don't want to make you happy. Um, <laughs> making people happy is 20 hours of my time 
my relationship with God's two hours and relationship with my partner 14 hours of my time, I can go, whoa, there's something way off here. Like, I actually value the addictions that I get from other people more than I value my relation, my partner. That's pretty disturbing. And when we look at that, we go, wow, that's pretty disturbing. What can I do to change that is the next obvious question, isn't it? Now, many of us do not take the next obvious question. We don't go further. We, we see it how it is, and then we go down either a hopeless road where we say, it's like that, but there's nothing I can do about it. Or we say, in this case, with our partner, it's like that, but the reason why is my partner really doesn't want to spend much time with me. It's like that, but my partner doesn't really want to engage sexually with me. So all we have is the other time available. Or it's like that, but my partner has their job and their work and they, they like their family better than they like me. And that's why I don't get to spend much time with them. Right? We, we often list a lot of reasons for why it is like it is without considering our part in the creation of the truth. That's what we do. We blame the other or we blame the circumstances or situation rather than examining our own desires. You see, if I really wanted to change that situation with my partner, I wouldn't be putting up with my partner only wanting to spend 14 hours a week with me. And to be honest, if they didn't have a similar priority system as myself, I'd be saying, well, you need to go and find yourself a different partner. Because this is what I want my priority system to be. This is what's going to make me happy. This is what's going to make us both happy in the long run. And if we're ever going to be at one with each other as soulmates, if you believe you're soulmates with the person, then there's going to be a need for there to be some kind of adjustment. Now, you can't force your partner into making the adjustment, but you can certainly change your own decision to sit in it as it currently is. Can you see you have to take an action? Many of you don't want to take an action. Many of you would not be prepared to leave your partner if they refused to develop your relationship with each other further. Many of you wouldn't want to do that because you want to maintain the status quo. You want to keep it as it is. You don't want to lose what you already got. You don't want to make it better. Or you want to make it better, but not at the cost of losing it. And that's a fear. That's an addiction. Does that make sense? Jennifer, you had a question? Um, what if you're not in a relationship because your partner was unloving, but your partner is your soulmate? Um, I feel the same thing applies. There's obviously things going on inside of yourself that you're not seeing that still cause the repulsion of your partner. Because the reality is, if, you're, if your partner was drawn to you strongly, they would actually feel like, I want to be with that person. And then they'd start having a feeling like, I'm going to have to change to be with that person. That's what they would feel in the end. So there's obviously some emotions inside of the individual who's not with their partner that is causing the, the partner to be resistive to going through that process. Does that make sense? So the alternative, of course, is that they're not your soulmate. And somebody else is that you, that you won't accept. You, you want to hold on to that particular person. I did that for years where I held on to one particular person thinking that they were my soulmate, unwilling to address the emotions involved with the release of that relationship. Once I went through the emotions, I knew exactly that she was not my soulmate. Does that make sense? And I believed it wholeheartedly up to that point. But as soon as you work your way through the different emotions that block, either your real partner will be drawn to you, or if the person who's blocking you at the moment is your soulmate, they'll be drawn to you. They can't help it. You, we're not trusting God's laws. Like, Mary couldn't help it. <laughs> she would have liked to have helped it <laughs> right? by her own admission, right? But she couldn't help it. You know, she ran away three months later. She's going, oh, I have to go back. You know, like, 
because because they won't be able to help it once once you work through the actual blockages yourself to to uh, that opening you up to the to your soulmate. That applies to every single one of these issues, actually. Yeah. So so I'm not saying you're to blame. What I'm saying is there are emotions inside of us that we are unwilling to feel that cause the stagnation of the development of the soul. And remember, the soul is the two halves, not just one half. It's two halves. So when I'm talking about the stagnation of the soul, I'm talking about both halves, not just the one half. So if both halves aren't coming together, there's a very good reason in both halves. Many of you are not prepared for the level of honesty you're going to need to develop your relationships. You're just not prepared for it at all. You're not prepared for the level of openness that you're going to need. Because in the end, if to become one, you're going to have to know everything about your partner. Everything. Their thoughts, their feelings about every subject, what they've felt about, about all different people in their life. Everything. Many of you would be so emotionally challenged by that experience, you wouldn't handle it emotionally at the moment. So you don't want to know. And because you don't want to know, you block your partner. And because you block your partner, you can't have a relationship. You're not going to have a stable relationship in that place. These are all things that are telling us what our treasure is. What, our, what is our treasure under those circumstances? We are afraid. We are treasuring our fear. You know what I find very interesting about fear? What is the one subject that I have discussed with you where I have consistently said to you over and over again, I don't know the truth about this particular subject, but I'll tell you what I feel currently. What's the one subject that I've done that with? Um, so, Dennis? Your identity. My identity? No, I know for certain my identity. Oh, sorry, I mean us. Oh, no, no I, I'm talking about what I said I don't know. Yeah? So, uh, sorry, Matt. Earth changes? Earth changes. That's the one subject. What's the one subject that most of you have acted upon? <laughs> Can you see my point? The one subject that I have said that I'm not certain about is the one subject that the majority of you have acted upon. How logical is that? that? That's one of the most illogical things that I can see in a group of people that I've ever seen. It's like you don't hear what I'm saying to you. I'm saying I'm not certain about this subject. I open the discussion. I'm not certain about this subject, but here's what I feel at the moment. And by the way, I still feel they're going to happen. But, but, but not any time soon, I feel, at this point. And, and, like, I still feel that. But, but the point is, I have said to you over and over and over and over and over again, and I've prefaced every discussion that I don't really know the truth of this subject, and yet many of you have changed your entire lives based on what I've said about that subject. Do you know why? Because it's certainly not logical, is it? And whenever there's not logic, there's always an emotion driving something, right? So what, why? Why do you think it is? If we go back to that. Because we're really, really afraid. Ah. Isn't it interesting that I talk about a subject that you're afraid of and you listen more to that than I talk about a subject that you're not afraid of and you don't really, you don't really listen much at all to that? Isn't that interesting? This is a collective problem. You know, that's, you, do you know why the television media and the newspaper media and all of these different forms of the media love giving you bad news? Because you love receiving it. It's the thing you'll act upon. It's the thing that will change your motivations. It's actually the thing you treasure. You treasure nursing your fears. That's what you treasure. You treasure nursing your fears. And your life is demonstrating that to you. For many of you right now, your life is demonstrating that to you. Now, when I think about that, I go, man, I've talked to Mary about this a lot. I've just said, isn't that so interesting how the one thing that I'm not certain about is the one thing that everyone acts upon? 
And all of these other things, I am dead certain of. I am dead certain you can create a relationship with God. I am dead certain that God's got love to give you. I know exactly how you can consistently receive it. I've talked to you about this hundreds and hundreds of times. I know exactly what the soul is like. I have memories about my own life, my own soul, Mary's life, her own soul. All these different things. I'm so certain of those things. They are concrete for me. And the one thing I'm not certain of is the one thing everyone listens to. And not so much listens to, but acts upon. That, that's an interesting thing. And that shows you how much fear still dominates your decision-making process. Doesn't it? Yeah? That? So just out of curiosity, if you suddenly became certain, would we be less afraid? <laughs> or would we still act... <laughs> Would we still act from a fear-based thing because then you are certain? Because I know that you've talked about things that you're dead certain about, you know for a fact, and they address some fear in me and I, and I struggle with those things anyway. Yep. So. Yeah, no, I agree. Because the fear exists in the individual, they will always respond to that subject in a, in a very illogical manner. And is it just driven because we really don't believe it's a seamless existence? That we are eternal and that yeah. there is no death. How many times have I asked you to put up your hand if you believe that you're not afraid of death and the most of the audience puts up their hand and your, your very life is demonstrating to me right at that... Why do you think I ask you these questions? <laughs> like, because I know you're lying to yourself. <laughs> That's how I ask you them, right? I know the majority of you are still lying to yourself about your fear of death. You're still lying to yourself about it. Your life, your very life is demonstrating you're lying. Do you think a person who's afraid of death goes and thinks they are a limited being with a limited resource, with limited, you know, with limited anything, limited life? No. This is a demonstration of your fears. And I ask you the question, and, and 90, still 90% of you put up your hands and say, no, I'm not afraid of death anymore. And I, I'm sorry, can't agree. Can't agree. Your, your very life is demonstrating to me that, that, that you are. Yeah? And, and this is why self-deception is so dangerous, right? You can be asked the question from somebody and you go to me, why is he asking me that question again? Man, it's like a broken record sometimes, you know? Do you understand? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm asking you that because it doesn't make sense to you. Do you, do, you, do you understand? I can feel it doesn't make sense to you. That that's why I'm asking you that question. And, and this is what is happening most of the time in many of these discussions. You do not realise what I know yet. You don't. Because if you did, you'd take a lot more notice of what I said than you currently do. All right? If you think of the average four-hour discussion I give to you, it is pregnant with life-changing material, every single one of them. And most of you, your life doesn't change afterwards, so that indicates to me that you don't value what's being said. Makes sense, doesn't it? It tells me that you think you already know it. And I'm saying that if you knew it, you would already be practicing it. You would already be doing it if you knew it. Don't tell yourself you know something when all it is is just in your mind. It's just a figment of your imagination that you know it. When you know it, you will be acting it. You will be doing it. Then you'll know it. You'll go through the process. Many of you have yet to touch your fear, for example. Many of you have yet to even feel what it feels like. Right? We can talk about fear to you blue in the face, but you're not going to know what I'm talking about until you start feeling some of it. That's the reality. You won't know what I'm saying. You will not know what it feels like to have a releasing-based emotion and receive a heap of divine love unless you go through that process at least once. You won't know. All right? And you won't know what's blocking you unless you come face to face with the fact that unless you're at one with God right now, there's a block. <laughs> there has to be. Unless we come face to face with that. You see, we tell ourselves many stories. 
many stories. And what I would like to do is ask you to start telling you, if you're going to tell yourself a story, tell yourself a truthful one <laughs> instead of the lies that you've told yourself many times. So let's look at this issue more closely about our treasure because it's so important to address. This eraser is not as good as the one we left down at Kyber, is it? <laughs> okay. Now, remember I said just earlier that your actions need to change. The only way that your treasure can change is for your actions to also change. Many of you are so terrified that you do not wish to change your minute by minute, day by day actions. You're terrified of all sorts of things. You're terrified of losing your relationships. You're terrified of being ostracized by people. You're terrified of feeling humiliated or controlled or manipulated or powerless or any of these long lists of feelings. But the underlying really issue is you're terrified to feel. You do not believe that you can cope with the feelings that are inside you. That's one of the primary issues that you face. To have change, you must choose a different course of action. And what are your actions based upon? They are based upon what you treasure. So the only way you are going to choose a different action is to confront the fear by treasuring something more than you did before. So, if I'm not addressing the relationship issue, if I learnt to treasure a relationship more than I currently do, then there's a higher likelihood that I will actually deal with my relationship issues. Many of us are not connecting with God every day. If I valued and treasured my relationship with God more than I currently do, then there's a higher likelihood I would connect with God more every day. Can you see that? What your treasure, where your heart, your heart will be where your treasure is, as I stated in the first century. So here's our treasure. Let's say that's the gold that's buried in our backyard. You know? That's the lottery. Now, if you treasure the things that we had on the previous page on the board, then of course the, it would motivate certain heartfelt actions. So it will change what you feel in your heart. So instead of going to yourself... All right, I spend 14 hours a week with my girl, but she doesn't really want to spend more time than that with me. And, and if, I, if I confront her about that, then she'll probably go into some feeling that I'm being controlling and manipulative and all of these other things, and she'll accuse me of different things, and I don't want to feel what it feels like to be accused of those particular things. And so what I finish up doing is I decide to not act, and the reason why I'm not acting is because in my heart, fear is more important to me and a greater motivator than actually love. Or truth should be. Now, can you see that if my heart is full of fear... Love and truth is going to really struggle to enter it, isn't it? If, you're, if you think of your heart like a bottle of water, and this one's full, if I, if I get my bottle of water 
and I try to pour something more into it while it's still full of something else, it makes sense that m m not much is going to go in. Logically, that's the case. This is what my heart is like. If my heart's full of fear and I'm unwilling to release that for some reason, then how can more truth or love enter my heart while I've got all this fear in my heart? I must at some point value or treasure love and truth over fear before I'll be willing to release the fear that's in my heart. That's what I need to do. I need to treasure the thing that is closer to God and closer to happiness than the thing that is preventing my relationship with God and preventing my happiness. But most of us don't. Most of us treasure the thing that's preventing our relationship with God and preventing our happiness more than we treasure the thing that could be creating our relationship with God and creating our happiness. Now you can see that's not very logical, but we are not often very logical beings because we are full of emotions that dictate a different set of logic. That's why people came up with the whole con concept of subconscious. You know, because they, they, over history, many very powerful and very good intellectual logical thinkers have looked at humanity and gone, this is very interesting. They say they want to do one thing, but they do something completely different every single day. They say they want this, but they do that. Why? And so you know what they did then? Instead of looking at it as a fear problem, right? they decided to create a third entity or a second entity sorry, inside of you called your subconscious. Does that make sense? Instead of just thinking, well, maybe there's a fear associated with everything that they're saying compared to what they're doing, they go, no, there's a thing called subconscious. They created a part of you that they believe is locked off from you that dictates most of your action. This is why I do not believe in subconscious. I believe that everything that is conscious is because you want to be conscious of it and everything that is unconscious is because you want to be unconscious of it. <laughs> All right? Quite simple. And this is the reason why this problem that we have in humanity is that large amounts of fear have been developed over many millennia of time that have been ingrained in humanity for such a long period of time that now most of us believe that fear is the thing we need to honour above all other things. And that's why we don't treasure anything else. Because we treasure our fear. We treasure our fear. Um, I struggle with that uh, diagram just because I've, I feel that I'm feeling so much fear but that bottle of fear seems massive and, and all the, the negative emotions or you know, the anger and, and fear that come up in every situation. What do you call massive? <laughs> um, like massive? The problem with such terms is they're not really quantifying terms. Like, yep. you know, to an ant, massive is, uh, is your foot. You know? Okay. All right. So um, when I did my list of, yep. of what I am doing each day, um, I look at how much time I'm releasing emotion I feel, I believe, my fears, my anger. And now, can I just stop you there? Yeah. What have I said to you almost every time I've discussed something with you? It's what we believe. It might not be true. No, what are, I've said something about spirits and you and your emotions. What have I specifically to you? Oh, okay, for me, um, that of, uh, in the past that I've been experiencing spirits' emotions and not my own. Yes, and why do you think I said that? Um, because I was getting overcloaked a lot. No, you know why I said it? Because it's true. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> That's why I said it. Yeah. You don't believe it's true. 
Remember, I also said to you that you need to look at the reason why you allow this to occur. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's what you need to do. Still. Still. Okay. Mm. I I did I did remember you saying. Um, I, well, I did feel I went through some of those blocks. Yes, you believed that you did enough to get beyond that point. Yep. But I'm saying to you sure. that, honestly, yep. most of you do not have the same level of fear that I had to release. Mm -hmm. uh, most of you have not been tortured to death. Who of you have been tortured to death? <laughs> no? Mary, myself, Corny, tortured to death. And you were tortured to death. All right. Physically or sexually? Yep. Okay. So, so there's four people in the room that have that level of extreme, like, feelings to feel. Does that make sense? All right. And I, I process through most of that fear in three months. Three months. So if you're taking longer than three months to process through your fear, what's happening? You're obviously not processing through your fear. You're not processing through... Yeah, see, you don't want to think it's that easy. You, you want it to be hard. This is one of your addictions, Jen. You want it to be hard. You want, to, you want to say to everybody else, you haven't been through what I've been through, so you know it's going to take me years and years and years. You want to believe it will take you years and years. You, you want to believe it. And that's what's stopping you from processing it. Right? And what I'm suggesting to you is that this fear inside of you is not as great as the fear of Cornelius, Mary or myself. Right? Each of us have had quite difficult lives to work our way through in the first century about how we died, right? Now, if you're taking longer than three months to process through your fear, what I'm saying to you is you're not processing through your fear. You're either living in it or you're processing somebody else's. Makes sense, doesn't it? If it can take a person who's been tortured to death to process through it three months, then it logically means that if a person who's not going through it in three months, obviously isn't experiencing the truth of their own fear. Now, I'm not going to keep asking, answering your personal questions about this matter. I'm stating a state statement about what's going on inside of yourself. What I'm illustrating to you, Money, is that you haven't listened to me about that. That's what I'm saying. And I understand why you may not want to, because you obviously have some emotional investments in processing other people's fear. Right? Or in the case of Jen, has emotional investments in not processing fear at all, right? of completely ignoring it, because it makes her feel like everyone should make, be sorry for her and things like that. And what I'm stating is that your treasure is your fear. Your treasure is your fear. You like doing it. Why? Because it might give you a feeling that you're getting somewhere, that it might give you a feeling that at least you're doing that. It might give you, you know, you don't want to feel hopeless feelings that you, you, that you need to feel at some point. You don't want to feel those. You want to feel like you're progressing every day. And so you place yourself in a position where it doesn't matter whose fear you're feeling. As long as you feel like you're doing something. Right? And there's layers of rage that are inside of you that you're unwilling to process as well. For the same reason. Right? But that comes from this treasuring of your fear. So what I'm trying to illustrate to many of you is that firstly, love and truth can't enter a heart that's full of fear. If we treasure our fear over love and truth, you will never process through your fear. Many of you are not looking at why you treasure fear. And there are a lot of emotional reasons why a person might treasure fear. Some of the emotional reasons are going to be things like it gives you a feeling of sorrow that you get from other people when you talk to them and they make you feel oh, this lovely feeling that they understand. You know, and you like that feeling. And if you have to give up your fear and release it, then people won't project that at you anymore. Right? You want people to feel sorry for you. That's the addiction. 
that's driven by you want you want a great fanfare many of you 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 want to have a great big huge emotional experience and have doctors and nurses and people and all other people fussing over you so that you they all know how hard it is for you and all that's fake it's all just facade huh? natalie is it possible then that we, um, we would treasure our fear? I know that sometimes when I've dabbled and, and experienced some fear, I feel completely powerless. And I hate that feeling so much. Yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why a person will hold on to their fear or even nurse it. Like some of you actually like it being there. You like it in your soul, the fear. It gives you all sense of justifications that you like to hold on to, you know? Like the justification of, I shouldn't have to tell people the truth because they'll get angry with me. Right? That justification. What's that about? Holding on to your fear of other people's rage. That's what that's about. Right? And you want to hold on to it. You want to tell yourself these things. Why? Because then you get to avoid situations you get to avoid truth you would get to avoid the actual emotion there's lots of self what i would call self justification techniques that we use to avoid the actual emotions i'm wondering how we can differentiate when we're genuinely confused and just really holding on to a fear i know confusion is probably just another fear yep but um for instance I want to walk as closely as possible um, towards, I want to work towards a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. I'd like to give up everything, all the material stuff and, and just basically take that path. Yep. Um, but I'm concerned about the security of my children who are grown up really now, yep. but they just might need financial support from me. Yep. So how do we know whether we're just confused about what is the right thing to do or whether we're just really frightened? <laughs> well, I think your statement is good that confusion is always a sign that there's a fear associated. Does that make sense? Because when we have no fear, we know almost automatically what is the right thing to do. You know, there's, there's a very direct course of action when there's no fear. Confusion is fed by fear. Confusion and doubt... Uh, indications of fear still existing that cause us to not see the complete picture. In the case you, you, you mentioned, the case of looking after children, particularly when children are grown up, uh, I had to go through a lot of emotions with my two boys where I had to give up this idea that I was responsible for their life. And uh, like Tristan now is 28, Caleb's 26, and I when they were 18, 19, I was still in this mode of thinking that somehow I was going to have to provide for them what they needed in their life. And then, and then after a while I realised that I had a fear and it was a, based around some feelings of guilt that I had to work way, my way through. So I worked my way through some guilt. Then I realised I had a fear of what might happen to myself if nobody came to my support. And once I worked through that, I realised that I didn't need any personal support from anybody ever and, and that I'd be fine. And once I worked through a couple of other emotions similar to that, I started realising that I did not have to support both of my sons ever again. I could give them a gift if I wanted to, but I did not ever have to support them. Now, both Tristan and Caleb initially felt a fair bit of resistance to that. <laughs> Right, naturally, because they were getting things before then. You know, like I'd bought them cars and I'd bought them and I'd paid for their house and I'd done a number of things for them. And now they weren't getting those things from me and they had to contemplate their own fear of creating those things for themselves. So, so now they had to work out what they treasured. They had to work out what, you know, they had to start working out whether they were capable in their life of creating those particular things. And what they did within, in a very short period of time for, for, for probably Caleb and for a bit longer time for Tristan, um, was they eventually worked through the issue and decided that they could control their entire life by themselves. They didn't need me or anyone else at all. And that freed them completely like from a lot of fear-based actions. So what I found I was doing was I was helping them 
stay in a place where they didn't have the confidence in God or themselves to create their own life. And I was actually assisting them to do it. And, and then I realised in that process that my assistance of them doing it was based on my fears about God not supporting my life. And I had to work my way through that. And once I worked my way through that, I now felt completely open to the guys looking after their own lives. So much so that uh, when I first met Mary, one of Mary's primary consider um, uh, condemnations of me, I suppose I'd call it, was that I wasn't connected enough to my family. And I'm saying, but I am connected to my family. I love my boys, you know, we get along together great, we have great time together. Uh, we don't, but Mary's family would ring her two, three times a, day, a week, many times, and, and expect her to live with them and all sorts of things. And she's above 30 at that point in time. And I'm going, no, that's not the kind of relationship I have with my boys anymore. We have a grown up relationship, you know, where the boys, well, I call them my boys, but the, the boys are completely self sufficient in their life. They do not need me at all all oh, isn't that wonderful for them that they do not need me at all but it's also wonderful for me because it allows me freedom to also do the things that I want to do and it's not like I'm going to not spend time with them because I do but but we have now complete autonomy so it's only a fear again that cause would cause the confusion now like yourself I was confused back then about that decision like at the time I made that decision, I felt like, ah, oh, you know, but I'd like to do this for my boys. One of the reasons why I was developing some uh, property was I wanted to be able to give the boys a house each and give the boys a car each, and you know, it was one of the one of the motivations. Not not a not one of many motivations, but one of them. And after a while, I realised I had to give all of that up because I was actually teaching my own sons that they were not capable of looking after themselves. And what a terrible thing to teach a person. Like there are many of us who are 50 or 60 or 70 who still feel totally incapable of looking after ourselves. Still wanting a backup, a backup plan. You know why most people in, the, in, in Eastern countries and in third world countries have families? Not because they love their children. For many of them it's because it's the source of their welfare in their old age. It's their backup plan. You know why they have boys? Because boys have a higher ability to have a higher earning and income and other, and other things in those locations more than girls. So they don't want girls because that doesn't help their backup plan. It's sad, but true. So I sort of feel like most of the questions we can ask, particularly when we have confusion, my assumption whenever I have confusion is I've got some fear that I'm not seeing. It's just a general assumption I make every single time. I'm afraid of something. Yeah. Emma? Um, when you're afraid, is it best to always be logical? Like the best way you can? Well, it's impossible to be logical while you're afraid. Okay, well, I... I feel like I really struggle getting into my fear logically. Um, well, it's impossible to be logical while you're afraid. Well, I kind of make myself have a panic attack. Amber, Amber, it's impossible to be logical while you're afraid. That's not sinking in. Okay, what, what's the Why best? do you want to be logical while you're afraid? Because um, you're afraid and you don't want to feel you're afraid. You don't want to feel your fear what you want to do is nurse your fear and have it controlled. That's why you're attempting to be logical while you're afraid. I'm saying to you that it's impossible for you to be logical while you're afraid. You're going to have to release fear to be logical. Okay, and <laughs> what is the best way to release fear? What's the best way to release anything? Feel it. Yes. <laughs> Fully. Feel it. Okay. Um, the fact is that you don't want to do that. Okay, so, so be honest. I don't want to feel my fear. That's the yeah, truth. You don't want to. Um, you would rather have children. You would rather have you know, a relationship with the same guy time after time when he's proven to you that he doesn't really care about you and love you. You'd rather do all these other things than feel your fear. That's the truth. 
And I'm, not, I'm just say, stating what the truth is. I'm not condemning you for it. I'm just saying there is a reason why you're unwilling to feel your fear and, and, and you're willing to choose addictions in order to not feel it. That, that's your treasure. And the reason I'm not wanting to feel my fear is that because I'm afraid of my fear? No, it's because you treasure your fear. How do I get rid of that? I'm just telling you how to get rid of that. Okay. okay. Yeah. You have to take a personal choice inside of yourself to treasure something else more importantly. And you're not doing that. You treasure your fear, and your mum does the same thing. Your mum is exactly the same as you. She treasures her fear beyond everything else as well. That's where your fear come from, come from your mother, right? So, so she treasures her fear above everything else. You treasure your fear above everything else. At some point, you've got to make a different decision. Well, I'm getting, I'm getting over having the fear so much. Like, it's... Are you? Well, uh... <laughs> Are you getting over it enough to go and feel it? No. So exactly. what's the best thing to do when I don't want to feel my fear, but it's wrecking my life, and in my head, I really want to get rid of it. I'm over it. So that's the first step. The first step is to recognise the truth that the fear is the thing recognizing, wrecking your life. Yes. It's not anything else that's wrecking your life. It's your desire to hold on to and nurse your fear that's wrecking your life. It's not the feeling of your fear that's wrecking your life. It's your desire to nurse your fear that's wrecking your life. There's a big difference between those two states. Okay, so what's... But now we're getting off the topic. Now we're talking about fear rather than talking about treasure. Right. And I don't want to do that in this discussion because there's so many good things to share with you. Yeah. Right? What I feel you are doing is treasuring your fear and what I'm suggesting to you is you, you need to make a different choice. Something else has to be treasured higher than your fear before you will feel your fear. Like a passion or something like that. Like a passion, like a desire. Desire for God, desire, for, desire even to have your kids grow up healthy, whatever. There has to be a higher feeling towards something else that's more important to you before you'll feel your fear. Okay, and I, I don't have that. No. Yeah, so... But you can develop it because okay. every single person can develop it. All right, so I need something that's more important than my fear to focus on. Yes, something that's so important to you that you'll go through your fear to get that other thing. <laughs> that sounds really good. Thank you. Does that you. make sense to everyone? Yeah. You have to have something that's going to pull you through this fear, that every single fear that you have, that's going to pull you through it. Something that's so important to you that you would not give it up even for the sake of your fear. Thanks, AJ. Yep. And that's the main thing. You see, it's what we treasure that will determine what draws us. Right? That's the thing we need to bear in mind. It's the thing we treasure. Now, once we treasure something, and the treasure of that thing is inside of our heart, right? we will not give it up for the sake of any other emotion, for the sake of avoiding any other situation or emotion. We will hold on to that thing for dear life. It'll be like, you know, and you, you'll be stubborn and you will not move on that particular thing. Once you've got something you treasure more than your fear, you will just hold on to that and it will draw you through. And what I'm suggesting is to have a complete relationship with God, the only thing that I have found strong enough to draw me through every single fear, and that's... A fear of what happens in my relationship. A fear of what happens with my family. A fear of what happens with my friends. A fear of what happens with my life. A fear of what happens with my welfare. A fear of other people's opinions. And blah, 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 blah. I can go on and on about what those fears are. The only thing I've found that draws me through every single one of those fears is my relationship with God. My relationship with Mary doesn't cut it. Because... If I focus on my relationship with Mary, it will draw me through a lot of fears until I get to the point where our relationship is confronted. And because that fear of our relationship being lost is greater, it will not draw me to the next step. Can you see? 
You see, where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. And where your heart is, will draw you through anything as long as it's greater than the thing it's drawing you through. And the only thing I have personally found that's greater than everything is the relationship with God. Now, you may discover something else, but I doubt that. But you can try. I've seen many people try. Like, honestly, where do you think the six, why do you think the sixth sphere of the spirit world is full of people? Because they don't treasure their relationship with God and there's other things they treasure. And therefore, the other things they treasure doesn't draw them to the end, to the point where they become at one with God. Because they still have fears. They are completely in harmony with the expression of their love, their natural love, their human-based love, but they do not receive love from God because of certain fears. And some of it is about a fear of being controlled and a fear of those, those kind of things that many of you are afraid of still, right? Yeah. Yeah. Many of you are even afraid of love because you think love will be controlling. How many of you ladies do not want to enter a relationship with a man because you think he's going to control you? How many of you feel that way? Ladies, you could pretty much all put up your hand. Can you see the self-denial? How many ladies are there in the audience? Please put up your hand. You all have a fear of opening your heart. Now, how many of you believe that? No, I'm sorry. Very few of you believe that. <laughs> Very few. All right? And this is something you've got to bear in mind. Very few of you believe that. Because if you believed that, you'd be wanting to address that as a high priority, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to be going through the process of opening the heart and actually addressing the issue of the fear that you have, the fear of being controlled, the fear of being manipulated, the fear of the man having more power than you physically, the fear of him sexually overpowering you. The fear, you know, we could list quite a lot, right? And you will find that many of you, if not all of you, will have it. Why? Because it's something that's in most of humanity and it's something that needs to be released. Natalie? AJ, I had that experience recently where I felt my heart opening a little bit and I realised how terrified I was of that actually happening. Yep. It, does it get to the point, because the feeling of your heart opening and the feeling of love is so much nicer than the terrifying feeling? Of course. Does it overwhelm? It, it gets to a point where you honour, or you could say where you treasure... <coughs> the feeling of love that comes from an open heart more than you treasure your fears of losing the relationship or having some problems of losing yourself yeah. in the relationship. Does that make sense? Once your treasure is in the love-based feelings that you're now enjoying more and more, you'll, you'll go to yourself, I do not want this fear to be in me anymore and I know I've got to feel it to feel it so I'm going to feel it. I'm, as I said, once you treasure something more than you treasure your fear, you will go through it. You and it will. was so much more appealing to want the love feeling than yep. to nurse the fear. Yep. But for many of us, we've never felt love for most of our life, if not all of it. So we've never had even the feeling of being loved so we don't trust at some point, we're going to have to treasure trusting God, even though we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We're going to have to treasure the relationship with God more than we treasure holding on to the emotion. Thanks. Right? For most of us, this is not what is happening. For most of us, what is happening is we are treasuring the holding on to the emotion more than the actual relationship. Many of us treasure the holding on to the emotion more than our relationship with our partner. That's why we fight all the time with our partner, if, if we do. Because we treasure holding on to the relationship more than we treasure developing in love. Right? We need to be aware of these things. Okay. 
Now, I've been focusing on this issue. There's a lot more I'd like to talk about. What's the time? Five to one. Five to one. Well. And I said to Mary that I might not get to discuss both subjects with you today. I am only halfway through this subject. Um, and maybe a bit less than that, actually. Because there's this whole aspect of this subject that we need to consider. And my feelings are I'd probably like to either consider that with you, or if you wish to drop the subject and move on to the next subject for the next half, and then we'll have to have two halves some other time. <laughs> what would you like to do? Continue with this subject? OK. So um, what we'll do is uh, I'd like just a five more minutes or so of your time and, and then if we remember to allow the guys five minutes or so out, outside to sort of set up the mill and so forth. But I'd like to speak a lot more about this subject. The thing I would like to speak with you about next is this very important issue of self-examination. Without it... Without honest self-examination, you are not going to be able to even see what you treasure. It's very important you see what you treasure, as we've pointed out to you. See, whatever you treasure is where your heart will be, and wherever your heart is, is what you will do. Right? Doesn't matter whether you think you value it or not. Wherever your heart is, that's what you value. And you need some self honesty, self-examination to know that. And this is why I suggested that um, process at the beginning of this discussion with you. The process of listing all of the things you think you value and the process of then listing all of the things that you actually value with your time and comparing the two things. This is the start of self-examination. Once you go through the start of self-examination, you can see what you actually treasure. You'll stop saying to yourself, no, I'm all right with that. No, I'm all right with that. You go, well, I'm not right with that. And I'm not right with that. And I'm not right with that. And basically, I'm not right with anything. <laughs> That's what you'll do instead, right? Instead, what many of us are doing is we go, yeah, I'm right with that. 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 And why don't I have a relationship with God? Because you've just ignored all the things you're not right with. Right? We want to tell ourselves so many things that we need to give up telling ourselves and we want to know what the truth is instead. To actually progress, each of us is going to need to have a personal desire, not, not a desire that involves anyone else, a personal to desire to actually know what the truth is. Nobody else is responsible for this desire. Right? The reality is Jesus can come along and say, I know everything about you, and you could listen to him for years about everything about you and still not get anywhere. And you know why? Because unless there's a personal desire, no change will occur. When you have a personal desire, you do not need Jesus or anyone else to show you what to do because you've got a personal desire in your relationship with God. Through that relationship, you will be told everything you need to know. God's laws are, are there as much for you as they are for me. How did I progress in the first century and now? Not by listening to everybody else but by listening to what God was telling me through the law of attraction and through my own conversation with God. You can do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. You do not need another person to do this. However, if you are not honest with yourself, you'll get nowhere. You'll get nowhere. All right. If you do not know how to examine yourself, you will get nowhere. So what we would like to do is, after this break, I am going to go through issues of self-examination. And what the purpose of these issues of self-examination are, is to help highlight what is really our treasure. Because remember, what is really our treasure is what will motivate our heart. If our treasure isn't what we're saying it is, then our heart will be motivated in completely different directions than what we want, where we'd like it to go. 
to, to truly change in a positive direction towards God, we're ne- going to need to have our treasure in that relationship. Now, that is very difficult for many of us because we've not had that relationship before. And so we don't know how important it is for our future development. And so we don't treasure it. We have had a relationship with a person before, most of us, or we do have a relationship with our family, or we do have a relationship with our friends or our workmates or other people on the planet. And so that's what we finish up treasuring more than our relationship with God because we've never had a relationship with God and we don't know how to value it. But what I'm suggesting is for our progress to continue exponentially and also continuously in our existence, that treasure, God, the relationship with God, needs to be our greatest treasure. Right? For many of us, it's nowhere near our greatest treasure if you analyse the amount of time you put into it each day. Can you see that? Many of us, the amount of time we put into our relationship with God each day is driven by frustration, annoyance, a feeling of disconnection and many other emotions that we're going to have to release in order to work through getting to have God to be our treasure. And many of us are not prepared to work through those emotions. So what we do is we give up the concept. We like hearing about it because the soul sings, you know, sings. Ah, it's a lovely thought, right? We like hearing about it, but we don't really believe it's possible. And because we don't really believe it's possible, we don't put much time into it. What I've personally found is that many of the times that I don't believe something's possible, I very rarely invest any time doing it. Have you found that? Like, how many of you ladies or or guys have gone out to your car, turn on the ignition, you've got no idea about a car, you don't even bother lifting the lid, right? What do you do instead? You ring for help. (laughs) Yeah? Someone else has bothered lifting the lid and understands those things. And so what you do is you ring for help and, they, and you get them over and they help you. They don't teach you anything in that process though, do they? And so the very next time you go... Rah, 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 rah. What do you do? You ring for help again. Many of you are like that with me. Why are you like that with me? There's things I don't know. So why are you like that with me? Chase, why do you reckon you're like that? Because you've already bothered to look up the lid. Ah, you want to rely on my knowledge without having to go through the process of knowing how to learn this knowledge yourself. That's an emotional investment in an emotion, isn't it? Like a desire to rely on somebody else rather than on yourself isn't it Mm. so what I'd like to do in the after the break is I'd like to talk with you specifically about how to go through more processes of self-examination and and what we can do in that process to try to flip over some of our treasures to try to get from one place with our treasures where our treasures, when we look at our time, we see that our treasures are out of balance and get to a different place with our treasures where, where we can see, yes, this is in the balance that I really intellectually and emotionally want it to be in terms of my time now matches what I think are the most important things. That's really where we want to go, isn't it? And it doesn't really matter um, in the long run if, if you want to try not God as your treasure and try something else. As long as you're spending more time on that particular thing, you are having more integrity, are you not? So, you know, it's one thing to say you honour this and you, inter- you, you treasure this. If you're not spending much time doing it, then I suggest you, you don't really honour it and you don't really treasure it, right? What we need to do is at least bring our treasure and our perception of our treasure into harmony with each other, at least in order to be a person of integrity. 
I'm suggesting we can even go further than that, and that's what I'd like to discuss with you in, after the break. Does that make sense? So let's have a break now, and uh, if we go for 45 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and do that. Thank you.